Maybe midnight or midday. Never early, never late. He gon' stand by what he claimed. Lived enough life to say. I heard your heart. I'm Candace Fowler. I'm one of the pastors here at First Church, and it is good to be with you tonight in worship. We have three very important things we want to tell you about. First off is, um, it's, we have, I think, a, an announcement slide for this, but it's not the right date in the bulletin. There was a mix-up on scheduling. And uh, not on our end, but <laughs> it was just a mix-up. And so the pool party is not going to be on the 27th. It's going to be on um, September 3rd, okay? So if you all were planning on coming out to see me get a pie in the face, well, make sure you don't come on the 27th. Wait a week and come back on the 3rd. Also coming up on the 23rd of this, uh, August 23rd this week, is we have a kickoff for our volunteers for Promised Land. Now, Promised Land is our ministry that ministers to our children um, like zero through sixth, fifth grade, fifth or sixth grade, depending on how Sunday school is broken up that year. And I want to tell you some really good news because you're not here always to see uh, because you're here on Saturday night and not here on Sunday morning. This time last year, we had about 12 children that would come on a Sunday morning. Currently, we have about... 60, the 65 children that come on a Sunday morning. Yeah, wow, isn't that amazing? And so let me tell you what that means. Is if you have ever considered giving an hour a month, one hour, one Sunday morning to our children's area of ministry, this is the season that we need you. Um, in order to make sure we have a really safe environment where kids can continue to learn and we keep our ratio down with our kids and to, par uh, to teachers, we do need some people to step up and say, I will help for one Sunday a month. So if you are willing to do that, please plan on coming to the volunteer uh, meeting here at the Celebration Center on the 23rd. It's at 6 o'clock. They'll give you all the information. You can even tell what age is your favorite age to work with. But we are growing here at First Church. It's a beautiful problem to have, isn't it? Uh, and so uh, please plan on being there and um, just, just come and find out more information. We would really uh, greatly appreciate it. 
Also, maybe this week you saw at the Thompson site and here at the Celebration Center, maybe slides that said, uh, let your light shine, and it had in memory, honor, or celebration of someone's name. Well, we're doing something here at First Church. It's a capital campaign um, to replace these theater lights that are on the stage. Currently, we don't have any lights that face directly towards this Area. So we are going to be um, raising money for, uh, with, through your gifts and offerings for that for however long it takes to raise that money. We need a little over $70,000 to do that. And um, in order to make it kind of fun, no matter what size the gift you give, you can have a slide put up on either of the, um, both of the LED signs to, in celebration, honor, and memory of someone. But I want to tell you some really exciting news. As of today, we have already had $17,000 given for the lights. Isn't that amazing? And so we give God glory for that. So friends, we do not serve a God of scarcity. And so we thank you for all the beautiful ways that you're giving um, to these lights. They are not an inexpensive um, uh, investment. They're over 20 years old, and that does cover the labor to, to take these down and replace that as well. So we're going to be I have a stage all lit up again because of the beautiful ways that you give. So if you need more information about that, you can call the office here at the um, Celebration Center. We'd be glad to give you more information. Well, this evening, the mission candle is lit for the glory of God. Would you join me in giving God praise today? We're going to go into this time of prayer. Pastor Christopher is with his family this weekend. They're taking a little short trip to Oklahoma to visit family. Uh, so as you remember your staff and your church, please pray for the Wisner family as they travel home. So would you join me as we open this worship service with, with prayer? Lord God, we give you glory and honor and praise. For you are the beginning and the end. You are the very breath that we breathe. And so tonight, Lord, as we are gathered here in this place... We invite you to move within our hearts. Stir within us, Lord, awakening something new. Lord, we thank you. We give you praise for you are due it all. In the powerful and loving name of Jesus, we pray on this day. Amen. Stand as you're able. Greet those around you to our online guests. We'd love to know you're here. Would you sign in? Welcome to worship. Hello you guys, my name is Lucy and this is Kate and welcome to worship.
You may be seated. Please join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be able to come into this house of worship tonight. We thank you that we can be here among friends, among family. We ask God that you would move within the walls of this building. Pour your spirit out on us. Help us to know what it means, God, to hear your voice. Help us to quiet our hearts and our minds and to say, yes, God, speak to me now and let us hear those words. Let us hear what you say to us. Let us push all busyness aside and say, God, I'm ready to listen. I want to hear you speak. And God, we thank you tonight for the wonderful weather that we have had. We've had so many people in our community this past week for the fair And it has been a blessing to them, God, the wonderful weather. We thank you for that. We know that you are the provider. You provide the rain. You provide the sun. For which we are so grateful. God, we come to you with thankful hearts. Thankful for your faithfulness. No matter what we do, where we are, you always are faithful. God, help us to love the way you do, to show others kindness, tenderness, and caring. We might be just that one person that they need to see to know that they are loved. And God, it's with great joy that we come this week praying for the Lamine Baptist Church. God, we pray that you would move through the walls of that church. Pour your spirit out on that congregation, Lord. Help them to be strong And to step forward in faith and say, we are truly followers of you, Lord. Help them to be bold in this community, to reach out to this community and say, yes, we are followers of the one true God. And be with the pastor, Lord. Help him to speak your words. Help him to have that understanding of exactly what your words mean so he can tell those that he is serving of your amazing love and grace and mercy. And Lord, we come this week praying for the Camdenton R3 School District. They're not in school right now, God, but we still need you to move through that building. Be a presence in that building. The teachers are coming back, and they need to feel that you are there. And those students that are getting ready to come back, Lord, please open their hearts and their minds so that they can soak up everything they need to learn so that they can be in a spirit of learning so that everyone in that school can have that chance to learn. We thank you, God, that we are in a wonderful country that does have that education, those schools that those students can come to, to learn. Help them to open their minds, God, and to be ready 
All these things, God, we pray in your son's wonderful name. Your son who taught us to pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I love that. One of my favorite songs. Thank you. How many of you like to eat? <laughs> How many of you haven't had dinner tonight? <laughs> we want to tell you about a new group. We have life groups, and there is a sign-up table out there. Becky Ott and I will be out there after. We've had life groups for most of this year. Uh, wonderful, wonderful way to get to know people and to grow in the Lord. They have a study component. We are starting a new type of group called... 
dinner groups. And you can tell from the name what you're going to do is eat. It is a way to connect people, especially newer people, new members. And the groups will be formed and announced in about the first week of September. Simply put, the groups will meet probably monthly, and they will meet maybe at a restaurant they get to pick, or at a home for potluck, or um, somewhere else and have a themed meal. And we'll give you ideas for theme meals. Becky Ott's Life Group is the, is the crown of theme meals. They're a lot of fun. So I hope you will consider that. There are handouts out there for both types of groups. Take one with you. Give it to a friend. This is a good way to say, let's go to dinner together. And we will all be blessed by this additional way of being connected through our Lord. Thanks. Well, that's exciting. I just would like to be part of one tonight because I haven't eaten dinner yet. So, <laughs> hey, we want to thank you for all the beautiful ways that you give, whether you're giving of your time and talents and especially as you give um, of your resources, too. And we are so thankful. Um, if, you have a, if you are online, you can give through Secure Give. We have joy boxes at the doors. But however you give, know that you are a blessing to this church, this community, and to God. Um, if you're a guest with us tonight, we want to welcome you. We're so glad you're with us in worship, but we don't want you to feel any obligation to give because you are our guest.
Have you enjoyed seeing those families each week? Beautiful, aren't they? So how many of you took in the fair? A few of you all? So, hey, I wanted to bring something to your attention. I don't know if you noticed this or not, but last year and this year, we have tied our sermon series theme into the fair along with the fair. So last year, we did... We had the buckets of fun, and it was the bucket list, and this year it's where traditions grow and how we have the same colors, and it says where families grow together. See what we did there? So now the question is, what will their theme be next year? They might call us, actually, (laughs) and get some ideas from us. But anyway, um, whether you went to the fair or not, um, it's been fun to hear the accounts and see people's pictures of what they've been doing. So how many of you have siblings? Anybody have siblings? Okay. Um, so if, how many of you that have siblings have one of those stories that you tell about your siblings? Like, you know, uh-huh. How many of you are the person they tell the story on? Maybe some of you are. Okay. All right. Well, psychologists say that children, um, siblings that argue, that they are in, that is a sign of the children feel safe in their home. So if siblings are arguing... That is a sign that they feel safe in their home. But I'm going to tell you what, with five children, there were many times I wished that my children didn't feel so safe. (laughs) And so, uh, yeah, there's just, uh, in any family, there is a bound to be um, disagreements. Now, we took a family vacation a few years ago. Chapman would have been four, and so then Morgan would have been 13. So four to 13, five kids in there, and it was hot. And all of a sudden, I started seeing, don't, I heard I started hearing, don't touch me. Don't lean on me. Don't talk to me. And I finally said, okay, nobody's talking to anyone. No one is touching anyone. And then this started happening. <laughs> and like, if this is their brother, they would do this. <laughs> and so I had to add to that. I would say, okay, no touching each other, no talking to each other, no pretending to talk to each other, no pretending to touch each other. Tell you what, I am not naturally blonde, friends. There's a lot of gray under this hair color because these kids, I'm telling you. Um, But you know what, it it is, in all seriousness, it is expected that there will be disagreements when people spend a lot of time together. When they live together, uh, there will likely be a squabble going on. And so we're gonna talk about that tonight. Um, And whether there's a hurt that's happened yesterday or um, re- maybe years gone by, there's likely been uh, someone in this room that's had a disagreement with a loved one that there are still hurts from that. And you know, instead of sometimes pretending like we're not talking to that person, we just don't talk to them. And the chasm of that argument becomes, that's been created by the argument just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then we find ourselves days, weeks, years later, and all of a sudden we haven't talked to someone who we once had called a very close loved one. But I believe that we can learn through Scripture and through God's work, working in our life how to bring forgiveness to our relationships. And so we're going to talk about that tonight. Uh, would you join me in prayer? Lord God, we are thankful for, thankful for how you bring healing to our life, how you encourage us, God. And we are thankful for your forgiveness. So, Lord, would you teach us tonight how to forgive? And, Lord, may my words and my thoughts be pleasing to you. In your strong name we pray. Amen. So we're going to talk this night about a story that we find in the 37th chapter of Genesis. Now, it's about Joseph. It actually starts long before that with Joseph's Joseph's ancestors. But we're going to specifically focus on Joseph. Um... This week, this tonight, and I want to tell you a little bit about Joseph. He had thirteen. Uh, he was one of thirteen uh, brothers, siblings. Uh, he said we're going to folk. Uh, his brothers were Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, jo- and then Joseph and Benjamin. Now Joseph and Benjamin share the same mother. There was also Dinah who was in there, and we know she was in Scripture. There might have been other sisters, but she's the only one that's mentioned. Um, they were, uh, but and Joseph's father was Jacob. Now Jacob showed partiality to Joseph because of the relationship that Jacob had with Joseph's mother. But that's a whole another story that you find earlier in Genesis. But that was strike one against Joseph because it was 
it was very evident that Joseph showed partiality to um, Jacob showed partiality to Joseph. He actually made him this beautiful robe that was ornate just for him. That was strike two for Joseph. And scripture says that his brothers hated him and were not kind to him. And the fact that the, um, that was not, if that wasn't enough to cause divisions, Joseph comes in one day and starts telling about his dreams. Now, I'm sure all of us have shared a dream with a family member before, but in that time, dreams carried a lot of weight. They were often used to truly foretell the future. And Joseph comes in, and, and these are in my words, comes in and says, hey, I just had a dream that all of you brothers are going to you know, bow down to me one of these days. Well, that was it. That was like strike three. They were absolutely done with Joseph, and they decided they were going to get rid of Joseph. They plotted to kill him. Now, Joseph's older brother spoke up and said, hey, let's not kill him. Let's just put him down in this cistern. Um, and then some people coming and traveling to Egypt came by, and they were like, let's just sell him. And so they sold their brother to these people traveling to Egypt. They took his coat and put the blood of an animal on there, and they said, we can tell our father that he was eaten by wild animals. I'm telling you what, that's some heated disagreement between brothers, right? Uh, that was a really big deal. So uh, that's what happened there, and then we're going to kind of scoot forward 20 years and seven chapters in Genesis. And when we get there, Joseph has been sold into slavery, but because of opportunities for him to be put in positions with people who carried rank, he was able to start elevating his position. And, um, and so he also had dreams that there was going to be a famine in the land. And so he um, told this to officials that there was going to be a famine, that they needed to say, start putting money, or excuse me, food ahead for this famine, for this drought that was coming. And then Joseph was elevated to the second in command in all of Egypt. Now, in Joseph's family... In another country, they are running out of food because they're part of this drought. And Joseph's father, Jacob, says, go to Egypt and get food there. So they go and to get food there. And when they get there, and this is a very abbreviated story, but friends, you should read this story. It was one of my very favorite Bible stories when I was a child. It has so much, like, intrigue. Because when the brothers get there, they don't recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognizes them. And so he accuses them of being a spy. He wants to know if there's any other brothers at home. He actually even puts, has somebody put a silver cup in the food that they're taking back, and then they're afraid to, they're, that someone chase after them, and they have to come back, and they hold a brother captive. They get Benjamin, the, the favorite brother, has to be sent back. It's just, it's just all this drama. And the whole time, uh, Joseph is trying to see if these brothers' hearts have changed at all in this time that they've been separated. And so finally, Joseph speaks up and says to his brothers, I'm Joseph, I'm your brother. And um, they were amazed and they were worried they were gonna, he was going to be angry. But Joseph embraces them and um, they come back together and restore a relationship of some sort at that point. Now, if we were watching this in a movie, this is when the slow music would fade and we would see the words and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> so, but this is not exactly all of the story. And in any disagreement, there's always more to the story because there's usually his side, her side, and what really happened. You ever notice that? But in every disagreement, there is, in conflict, there's hurt. There's someone's just got their feelings hurt, or maybe both sides of those, the feelings are hurt. And if, recon if reconciliation doesn't come quickly, then we've got another problem. Then a birthday party comes up, and you've got to go to a birthday party, and that person's there. Or you haven't, given for, haven't reconciled and you're at the grocery store and you see that person at the grocery store and you're like, you know, automatically like changing. Like, and you get home and they're like, why didn't you bring any bread home? Because that person was on that row and I couldn't go to that row, you know. Or there's a funeral. You have to go to a funeral and you don't want to see that person. You don't want to be in contact with that person. And so all of a sudden there's this big giant elephant in the room when you're with that person. And sometimes it feels like there's an elephant on your chest because you know you haven't reconciled with that person and you're not quite sure what you're going to do. Now, in our American culture, there's a family that we've heard about, likely maybe dating myself, maybe younger ones haven't heard this, but the Hatfields and the McCoys. They're part of American culture. 
And they fought and fought and fought and fought. And there's a lot of uh, uh, discussion about really how this started. For the most consistent story I could find was this one. Okay? The feud started in 1864 when a Confederate soldier named William Anderson Hatfield and Jim Vance, who was a cousin of Hatfield, murdered Union soldier Asa Harmony, Harmon McCoy because they believed that McCoy was responsible for shooting one of their friends during the war. Well, Asa McCoy's murder kicked off the Hatfield and McCoy feud. But that was far from the very worst thing that happened. The next thing that happened that they started fighting over when Randolph McCoy took the Hatfield family to court over the stealing of a pig. Now, we laugh about that, but if you all think about some of the arguments you've had in your life, they've been over smaller issues than a pig, haven't they? So the justice of this peace was involved in this case, but the justice of the peace's name was Hatfield. So the ruling, of course, did, of course, did not go to the McCoy's favor, and it was partly due to the testimony that was given by Bill Stanton, which was a distant member of both families, so naturally the McCoy's went and murdered Bill Stanton. In 1908, 82, excuse me, 84 years after the very first killing happened with the Hatfields and the McCoy feud, 84 years, don't you imagine somebody's even forgotten what they're fighting about at this point? This came up in an article in 1908 in an area newspaper. The death of Dom ha Don Tom Hatfield, the famous mountain feudist in um, Louisa, Kentucky, makes about the 60th victim of the Hatfield-McCoy feud that began um, 84 years ago as the result of one of the McCoy's razorback pigs swimming in the Tug River and the McCoy Place in the Kentucky side of the ancestral home. And so again, it's kind of back again what, what's really the real story. But 84 years and 60 lives later, these families kept fighting. This story has been part of our American culture. And it started with differing stories. How did it really start? Just like many of our conflicts. They've got different, different stories about how it started. His side, her side, and what really happened. But sadly, not forgiving is part of our American culture. And in most conflicts, there are tears. Because feelings get hurt, we're, we can't say the words, we're angry, and so we cry. And, and this is on men and women. This is not just about women. Plenty of, I've seen emotions on both sides. And in Joseph's story, we see tears as well. Now, I didn't read that story word for word, but I want to show you something interesting because in that story, there are seven accounts of when Joseph cried. The first is when the brothers are discussing what they've done to Joseph. And they've talked about how they treated it, and they don't know that Joseph is there. And Joseph overhears this conversation, and Joseph cries. And then they talk about the fact, he asks if it's the welfare of his father, and they say that his father is still alive. And Joseph cries. And then he, um, he finds himself in the presence of his brother, Benjamin, and he cries. Then I'm going to skip down to number five. Joseph sheds tear over family members that he's been separated from. When they finally bend back together, Joseph cries. And then Joseph cries when his father dies. And then the brothers are worried that now that his father's dead, now he's going to come back and get back at them for what they did to him when he was 17. And Joseph is weeping at the and their relationship, and it's restored again. But there are seven things. But here's the interesting thing. It's number four I didn't talk about. Right smack dab in the list of seven, number four, found in Genesis 45, verses 14 and 15. It's right smack dab in the middle and this is where Joseph forgives his brothers. The fourth reason in the seven times that he cries in that story. And I want to read this to you. It says, Jen Joseph could no longer control himself before those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. 
And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, is my father alive? And his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed they were at his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt, and now don't be distressed or angry with yourself, because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine that's been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing or harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you for a remnant on earth and to keep you alive for many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. And God has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over the lands of Egypt. And hurry up and go to my father and say to him, Your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all of Egypt. Come down to me and do not delay. And so Joseph invites them to come and settle there. All of Joseph's brothers and all of their families are to come there. And he says, and then he fell upon Joseph, Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept on his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them after all his brothers talked to him. The reconciliation falls right in the middle of that story. Right smack dab in the middle. It's like an Oreo cookie. The best part is right in the middle. This best part of this story is right in the middle of this story. Now, some of you all, I, I, don't, I don't want you to think about this and get distracted by, like, how did she figure that out? You know what? That's just an extra little piece for people who kind of geek out on those Easter eggs, those little fun moments that you find in Scripture. Don't get distracted by that. The most important part of this is that smack dab in the middle of the story like the most important piece, like it all comes in and highlights to the middle, is that forgiveness was given. That's what we need to focus on. And what I want you to remember is that the heart of the story is forgiveness. And what's forgiveness look like? Forgiveness means a lot of things to different people, but the, the core of forgiveness is the intentional decision to let go of resentment, and anger, to let it go. And the act of what happened, the hurt that you incurred, was, it will likely always be with you, but forgiving lessens the grip on it. Forgiving helps you get, that having that, that situation control you and continue to harm you long after that situation is over. And sometimes during forgiveness, it leads to compassion and understanding for the person who hurt you. And forgiveness doesn't mean that you always forget. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you have to actually make up with the person who brought you harm. It just means that you are allowing that person and the hurt that happened with them not to be the thing that's big in your life. But the forgiving is the main intent in that relationship. And Jesus was on the cross. The very first thing that Jesus said was, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. The very first words out of Jesus' mouth. Because, Jesus, because forgiving is like flipping the switch. And all of a sudden, it's instead of on an anger and hate, it flips it. And all of a sudden, it turns to love. And Jesus spoke often about forgiveness. Forgiving those who sinned um, against others. Forgiving those who had sinned against him. And inviting believers to continue his healing ministry. And you might think, well, what does healing have to do with forgiveness? Well, in Luke 19.10, we read that the Son of Man, who's Jesus, came to seek and, what's that word? Save the lost. And when you look at that Greek word for save, it's sozo. And it means to have a suffering one... To, to save a suffering one from perishing, to suffering from dis-ease, or to make well, to heal, to restore to health. And before you have disease, you can have dis-ease, and that's when there is not peace in your body, when there's not calm in your body. The dis-ease precedes the disease. And the saving comes along with that need that we have from Christ. And Christ's salvation that was offered on the cross wasn't necessarily just to save us from hell or eternal separation from God, but it was to bring us life 
to save us, to heal us from our dis-ease here and now as God brings the kingdom through those who believe in Jesus Christ. And friends, when we pray the Lord's Prayer each and every week, we say these words. Will you read this with me? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Do you know each week in prayer you say aloud that you'll forgive? You know, there's, there's really no act likely more difficult than to forgive someone, and especially when they have caused you harm or upset. But to show forgiveness is an act of love. And we're called to love. We are called to love. And one of our staff sent me a video, and it was a really a short video clip of Sheila Walsh. She's an author, and I think we've done some Bible studies here of Sheila's. But she shared about how her mother had this needlepoint picture that hung right above her bed. And so she slept under the words that said, yes, Lord. She said this was her mother's mantra for life was, yes, Lord. And she said, mother, doesn't that scare you? You don't know what you're saying yes to. And she said, oh, but I know to whom I am saying yes. You know, we are the say yes church. We sang those words tonight. It's part of our, our, the ethos here that the, we are the say yes, to say li- yes to life, to love, and to say, you know, saying yes to God. So the question is, we live into saying yes when we say yes to the things that God calls us to, which is giving life. And so how do we do this? And so tonight we're just going to walk through a few of these things on how do you lead to that place where you can forgive. The first thing is you start out with prayer. And you ask God to have the Holy Spirit empower you and to give you wisdom around these broken relationships. And you pray. And you pray those words that God would forgive you as you forgive others. And friends, you can pray that before you even mean it. If you simply offer your heart to God to do the changing. And then you have to recognize the value of forgiveness and how it will improve your life. And then identifying what needs healing. Is it your heart? Is it your mind? Is it someone? And who do you want to forgive? And then if you need help with it, join a support group. See a counselor. Talk to a friend or a pastor. Find someone who will encourage you to follow through with what God is calling you to do. It's an accountability partner. And then it's okay to acknowledge what's been done. It's okay to, to, to share this story with someone. Someone say, you know what, you were, it was, they didn't do the right thing. Or I can see how you felt hurt by that. It's okay to have someone validate that, but friends, don't stay there. And then you have to choose to forgive. It's a choice. We have a choice because of free will. We have the choice to do this, but choose to forgive the person who's offended you. And then release the control and the power that that situation and that person has over your life. You've likely heard that saying, but um, not forgiving someone is um, drinking poison and hoping the other person will die. (laughs) Unforgiveness hurts you so much more than it hurts the other person. And then finally, wrap all these actions again in prayer. I was watching a sci-fi show this week, doggone it, I said I wasn't going to ever do it again, but I watched a show on Netflix, and I didn't check to see if they finished the series, and I got two series in to find out they canceled the last three series. I thought the ending was so stupid, because it's not over, but it is over! 
Anyway, but this professor made this comment. It says, it's our inability to conceive those things that hold us back. Unforgiveness is the American way, but it's not God's way, and anything that leads us to anything but love is not God's heart. And I want to share this with you from 1 Corinthians. It says, verses 6 through 10, it says, It isn't a wisdom that comes from the present day or from today's leaders who are being reduced to nothing. We talk about God's wisdom, which has been hidden as a secret. But God determined this wisdom in advance, before time began, for our glory. It is a wisdom that none of the present day rulers have understood. Because if they did understand it, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. But this is precisely what is written. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love God. These are the things that God has revealed to us by the Spirit. And friends, it may be our inability to conceive forgiveness that keep, and healing that keeps us from forgiving. But we can trust God to show us the things that our mind cannot conceive that lead to the path of forgiveness and healing and love. And despite the tears that we sh- shed in the midst of the conflict, in the midst of the conflict can still be forgiveness. Say yes to life, to love, to God. Would you pray with me? God, as you have forgiven us, help us to forgive others. Give us your bravery. Give us accountability. And give us love. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Tonight we'll have a time of prayer, and if you would like someone to pray with you, it would be our honor to do so. We'll be listening to the song, Brother, by the Brilliance. Friends, I encourage you to read those uh, chapters in Genesis. It really is a really fun, I don't want to say fun, but it's a really interesting story. Um, And tell it to your children as they rise up and they go to bed as you walk around. This is a thing you should do, Deuteronomy. Five through nine, there we go. All right, let's stand together as we go forward with this prayer benediction. Lord God, we thank you for forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done on the cross. And Lord, help us to show your love to others by bringing forgiveness to our lives and others as well. In the powerful, forgiving name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Have a great week, you all. We love you.